good afternoon i'll be talking about uh, logical approach to orbital tumors basically i'll be covering um, the tumor part of it lakshmi has already covered infection inflammation very very beautifully so uh, i'll show you pictures as well as you know talk some theory on each of those this is a simple classification of orbital tumors primary and secondary primary can be for the classified as benign and malignant and secondary or almost always malignant this is uh, one more way of classifying orbital tumors based on the etiology cystic lesions are not tumors but uh, they come to an ocular oncologist so they are there otherwise it's vascular peripheral nerve tumors optic nerve and meningeal tumors myogenic fibrous connective tissue osseous and fibrosseous histiocytic melanocytic and epithelial tumors of the lacrimal gland this is a simple classification now before we start we should know what is the general frequency of these tumors in about 1000 patients we found that the top four are these lymphoproliferative could be lymphoma benign reactive lymphadenoplasia or atypical lymphadenoplasia vascular secondary and cystic these are the top four the next four or five are neurogenic inflammation which are biopsied and proven mesenchymal lacrimal gland lesions and infections next of it is all minority so if you know the relative frequency of tumors in india then you're slightly better off in identifying what you're dealing with let's start with this particular child now this child is born with a mass in the lower orbit right so how do you get a clinical clue what it could be he was born with it and it is slowly increasing in size now the child is about 3 and 1/2 months before you even attempt to open this i let you know which is very tensely obscured by a cyst you can't really pry it open without doing general anesthesia so you look at the other eye other eye has triangulation sign that means that if this is the shape of the cornea which is normally round if there is kind of a triangulation if the corneal contour is altered it is generally associated with uveal coloboma so one eye having uveal coloboma and the other eye you see a cyst that means that it could be an orbito palpebral cyst with microstomas and that is exactly what it was it is a bluish lesion but in the absence of a abnormality of the eye itself a such bluish lesions could be teratomas could be capillary hemangiomas could even be lymphangiomas with bleed so you have to exclude all other possibilities before you come to a diagnosis so what do you do in such a situation you simply aspirate the cyst because you have to prognosticate vision first and if you feel that there is any visual potential at all then you can excise the cyst or if there is no communication between the rudimentary eye and the cyst you can inject them with sclerosing agents if there is visual potential if there is no visual potential then you still can't simply leave the cyst alone so you can do sclerotherapy sclerotherapy can be done with many agents now exactly similar situation the child is born with this swelling the other eye is perfectly normal and when you do the scan you find that there is a enlarged eye and the lateral wall of the eye is missing and it is merging with the periosteum of the lateral orbital wall optic nerve of course is present there is no evidence of anterior segment structures so this is a congenital cystic eye in this situation there is no scope for vision and all you would want to possibly do is enucleation or evisceration and prehabilitate the child cosmetically the third proptosis in a newborn is if there is abaxial or axial proptosis this child just born is a teratoma you have to always consider the possibility of a teratoma in a newborn uh, proptosis and teratomas can be malignant or benign and if it's a malignant teratoma then there is generally involvement of the bone and intracranial extension periocular hemorrhage etc but if it's a quite teratoma like this which is in a quite white eye you can see a fully grown tooth within it and there are bony elements within it this was a benign teratoma and you have to excise it because otherwise there is a possibility of optic nerve compression in the child losing vision this is a simple uh, capillary hemangioma of infancy but with orbital extension so orbital tumors can also manifest in this manner generally capillary hemangioma of infancy is limited to the eyelid but rarely there can be orbital extension this is a rare lesion intraosseous hemangioma here what happens is that there is a lesion within the sphenoid vein and you see a large amount of uh, uh, lesion large lesion occupying the temporal aspect of the uh, bone 
and also intra with intracranial extension and also orbital extension. So this is a kind of a triradiate lesion centered in the spinoid vein, and it is hard to palpate. MRI can uh, or CT scan can help you diagnose it, but final diagnosis is always by a biopsy because there are simulating lesions. This can be curated. There is no other medical cure to it. So in children, if you want to classify proptosis, axial proptosis and abaxial proptosis, the most common cause for axial proptosis in children is optic nerve glioma. So if you have a child with unilateral or bilateral axial proptosis, look for stigma of neurofibromatosis. Look at the child for cafeole spots. Look at all other major and minor signs of neurofibromatosis. Look at the iris for Lish nodules. Look at the entire body surface for any signs of neurofibromatosis. And if you have one that actually clinically fits in because neurofibromatosis is associated with optic nerve glioma, of course, ONG can also happen without neurofibromatosis attendant. Now, if there is abaxial proptosis, then you further classify it as subacute or chronic. Acute abaxial proptosis is mainly because of infection, which um, Lakshmi has already spoken about. If it's subacute abaxial proptosis, there are possibilities. Abdominal sarcoma, leukemia, primitive neuroectodermal tumor, alveolar soft part sarcoma, etc. If it's chronic, then it is either lymphangioma or dermoid. Now, in the setting of a chronic proptosis, if there is acute exacerbation, then it is generally lymphangioma with intralesional hemorrhage or because of formation of a chocolate cyst. Now, this is a patient where there is very subtle proptosis. You hardly can notice that there is proptosis of the left eye, but she had squint because of which her parents took her to an ophthalmologist and you can see a nice optic nerve glioma there. This one more child where there is bilateral proptosis and parents took him to a doctor because the eye was not fixing, there was nystagmoid movement and you can note that there is mild proptosis of the left eye, right eye looks normal but there is bilateral optic nerve glioma. So axial proptosis cause is mainly optic nerve glioma in children, chronic axial proptosis. Now this is a child with abaxial proptosis uh, with in downward displacement of the eye resulting from a lesion in the superior orbit with superior phonacial fleshy lesion as well. This proved to be rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. So in this situation, you have to keep leukemia definitely in mind. You have to keep lymphoproliferative lesions such as non-African Burkitt's lymphoma in mind. You have to keep other differential diagnosis in mind. Even histiocytic lesions can occur like this. But rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma tops the list. In fact, rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma is the most common primary malignant orbital tumor in children. This is also an example of rhabdomyosarcoma. sarcoma. It is very vascular. You can see excessive vascularity within the lesion. And even when it occurs in the anterior orbit, you can see large blood vessels which are supplying this hungry growing lesion. So that is rhabdomyosarcoma. Of course, we won't discuss too much about the man management here. This one more child where there is abaxial proptosis, eyeball displays down with a lesion in the suprotemporal orbit, but she also has a subconjunctival hemorrhage. And when we did the fundus evaluation, she had broad spots, etc. So here, your diagnostic consideration is slightly different because rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma does not present with subconjunctival hemorrhage or rod spots. It's mainly leukemia that you're dealing with. So you don't have to do an orbital biopsy to confirm the diagnosis. You simply have to do a peripheral blood smear, which will show you these abnormal uh, uh, leukocytes, which confirms the diagnosis of granulocytic sarcoma. Now, this is something clinically you cannot diagnose it. A child presenting with subacute proptosis with a fleshy orbital mass, which is high vas highly vascular, deforming the eye. You can see uh, ISO density on CT scan. So you can't really say whether it is rhabdomyosarcoma or leukemia or um, for that matter, primitive neuroctodermal tumor, which is a very rare tumor. So on biopsy only, you can confirm all these are round cell tumors. So it's very difficult for the pathologist to confirm one from the other unless they do a good immunohistochemistry. Of course, peripheral blood smear will be abnormal in children with leukemia. Now, this is a patient where there is mild abaxial proptosis, although there is uh, axial component, which is more predominant, the eyeball also is displaced slightly down. And this is a lesion which is centered on an extraocular muscle. That is how typical uh, alveolar soft sarcoma presents. It is centered in an extraocular muscle. In this patient, it was in the superior oblique muscle. And it can be in the inferior rectus muscle, it can be the medial rectus muscle. But if a well circumscribed lesion is causing apaxial proptosis or slight displacement in the uh, predominant axial proptosis and it is in a child, then you think of 
alveolar soft part sarcoma, which can be confirmed by excision and biopsy. Now, this is a young uh, lady who has slight amount of displacement, but mainly it's an axial proptosis. And she has been having it for several years. And it is disproportionate to the size of the lesion. That's typically lymphangioma. Lymphangioma is chronic, so there is fat atrophy. So lesion grows at the expense of orbital fat. There is not much of proptosis unless they bleed. But lymphangioma can also occur anteriorly in the orbit. You can see a bluish discoloration, multilobulated, what called pseudoceptate lesion with bluish discoloration, which kind of hugs around the eye, does not cause uh, too much of displacement of the eye or does not have pressure indentation of the eye is uh, orbital lymphangioma. But orbital lymphangioma does not look always look as benign as it looks here. It can present with very dramatic features when it bleeds. This child had a small uh, minor injury at school while playing and then she came with this. So with this clinical appearance without any prior history of proptosis, you can't simply say what it would be. You know, you have to complete the diagnosis by doing a good radiological evaluation and then of course this child underwent an incisional biopsy during which time we uh, diagnosed that there was a larger lesion with clotted blood within it and that proved to be orbital lymphangioma which always was there but it was so subtle that parents never noticed it and it was noticed only when the child had massive bleeding. Now this is a patient where the lesion is there by birth but slowly increasing and this can also be present in the supranasal aspect. This is nothing but an orbital dermoid. Orbital dermoid is either present in the supratemporal orbit, that is external angular dermoid, or supranasally, that is internal angular dermoid. External angular dermoid is more common than internal angular dermoid. But orbital dermoid can also present with various other manifestations. It can be very large like this. All these have typical features in the sense that they are spheroid they almost conform to the shape of sphere. Some of them may have broader base like this, like this patient has a broader base. And if they have a broader base, then there is generally periosteal attachment. If you can move it in all directions, then that is a very uh, easy situation for surgical excision. But if it is fixed like this without much movement, that means that it has periosteal or sutural extension. Sometimes it may have even extra orbital extension or it may have uh, involved the bone as well. You know, in patients who have irregular margins like this with involvement of the rattle wall, getting the entire lesion out is very difficult. Also in situations like this where the bone is eroded and the lesion is irregular, you have to very carefully do a marsupialization. That means you excise one wall of it, evacuate the contents and remove the residual lining very carefully. Similarly, if it has a broader base and is fixed to the periosteum, you have to excise the periosteum along with the lesion so that it does not rupture. If it is extra orbital, like this patient has an orbital dermoid with an extra orbital component that is called dumbbell dermoid, you have to cut the bone on both the sides of the lesion like that, do an osteotomy and excise the lesion along with the bone through which it traverses. Otherwise, it can be breached. Now, this is a patient where there is a very small dermoid but yet you can see that there is a small extra orbital component and which is very clearly seen the defect in the bone which is small is seen on the CT scan, three-dimensional reconstruction. So in these patients you have to be very careful because if you just excise this part and leave this behind, patient might either have a fistula or recurrence. So you, it's mandatory that we identify if there is any extraocular extension, even small, and excise it. Let's get on to adults now. In adults, well-circumscribed mass, there are four main differential diagnoses. Of course, there may be many more, but the four main ones are cavernous hemangioma, neurilemoma, neurofibroma, and fibrous cystocytoma. If you're asked in the exam, what are the four differential diagnoses for a well-circumscribed lesion, you can give that in this particular order. This is in the order of frequency of occurrence. All these well-circumscribed lesions can produce either axial or abaxial proptosis depending on their location. If they're located in the intracoronal area, then it is typically axial proptosis. If they're located in the intracoronal area with extracoronal extension, then it is predominantly axial proptosis with slight amount of displacement. If they're predominantly located in the extracoronal area, then they have abaxial proptosis. If the tumors are located anterior to the equator of the eye, 
then they cause more displacement. If they are located posterior to the equator of the eye or in the intraconal area, they cause more proptosis than displacement. These are some of the teaching points. Now, all these patients have very mild proptosis compared to the size of the lesion. So it's been chronic, so it has grown at the expense of fat. Such a large lesion producing mild proptosis. All these are examples of cavernous hemangioma, typically well circumscribed and imaging is very characteristic whether it is CT scan or MRI and uh, uh, you can completely excise them. Another example of a well circumscribed lesion is neurofibroma. Neurofibroma mainly occurs either in the supraorbital nerve or the infraorbital nerve. Supraorbital nerve is more common. It can have extra, it is generally extraconal if it occurs from supra or infraorbital nerve but will have a major intraconal component. So they do have proptosis along with displacement very well circumscribed. You can see the nerve dipping into it. That's the nerve through uh, from which it has grown. So you have to excise the segment of the nerve along with neurofibroma so that it doesn't grow back. This is an example of neurofibroma, which also is very well circumscribed lesion. Neurofibroma is relatively rare. And this is benign fibrous histocytoma. Clinically or even on CT scan, it is impossible to tell a benign fibrous histocytoma from a neurilemoma, but MRI characteristics are quite distinct and neuro, uh, benign fibrous histocytoma can occur anywhere in the orbit, whereas neuro, uh, neurilemoma occurs majorly through uh, supraorbital nerve or infraorbital nerve areas. Now, again, a different way of uh, classifying adult proptosis is axial or abaxial. Four major causes for axial proptosis in adults in the order of uh, their occurrence is cavernous hemangioma, lymphangioma, optic nerve glioma, and optic nerve sheet meningioma. We already saw cavernous hemangioma. I will not repeat it. Lymphangioma, this 3D, you have already seen. But because she has an intraconal uh, component which is slightly larger, she has presented with uh, what looks like axial proptosis with very mild displacement. If you have a patient with mild axial proptosis and uh, loss of vision, and when you look at the fundus, you find these blood vessels. These are abnormal blood vessels with optic atrophy, which appears to be secondary. There is gliosis around the disc, and these are optociliary shunt vessels. So diagnosis is now very, very characteristic. It is not nothing but optic nerve sheath meningioma. There are differential diagnoses for optociliary shunt vessels, which could even be chronic optic neuritis, but if there is proptosis and if a patient has um, opto optociliary shunt vessels, then you are definitely going to put optic nerve sheet meningioma on the top of your diagnosis. Now, abaxial proptosis in adults are either lymphoproliferative lesions, neurilemoma, lacrimal gland tumors, or other structural tumors exactly in that order. Lymphoproliferative lesions are more common, followed by neurilemoma and lacrimal gland tumors. Lymphoproliferative lesions are soft or firm to palpate. They're never hard and this kind of mold around the eye. That is the classic description. They just surround the eye with rounded contours and they're isodense on uh, CT scan. Some of them can have irregular margins as well. But if you're really not sure what you're dealing with in a patient like this, you, can, you should always look at the entire eye and you lift the lid in the superior conics, you find this fleshy pink lesion with a salmon pink color. So it's clinically a lymphoma or a lymphoproliferative lesion. This is a patient with neurilemoma with a baxal proptosis. And again, a neurilemoma of uh, the infraorbital nerve here. You can see the lesion located in the inferior orbit. And that is the infraorbital nerve that has been taken out along with the lesion. And the eyeball is displaced upwards along with some amount of axial proptosis because it is also in the intraconal lesion, intraconal area. Now, this is an example of a supraorbital neurilemoma. Patient has mild proptosis because there is posterior extension and it is mainly in the extraconal compartment that it is there and it is arising from the supraorbital nerve and that's the chunk of nerve that has been taken out along with the tumor because otherwise the patients recur. This shows why they recur because you see this is the normal caliber of the nerve and you see the small little nodules. These are small little neurilemoma meta. So if you excise it flush with the nerve like that, then these remain to produce a recurrent tumor. So you have to always inspect and look at the CT scan very, very carefully like this nodule, this one here and this one here correspond to this and this. So you look at the MRI very carefully and aim to take out the entire lesion. They can also be bilobed. 
this is just to show you that if you don't excise the complete lesion well this could have been very small and it could grow back again so this is how neurilemoma can recur coming to lacrimal gland tumor this is a very classic classification not that it uh, holds the test of time because things have changed since it was described this way there is 50% uh, are epithelial and 50% are non epithelial in uh, non epithelial mainly you have specific orbital inflammations or non specific orbital inflammations and lymphoproliferative disorders lymphoproliferative disorders can be reactive indeterminate or benign reactive lymphoid hyperplasia or lymphoma non specific or specific you can only differentiate by doing a biopsy so biopsy is mandatory when you talk about an acrimal gland lesion in epithelial lesions you have 50% of them benign and 50% of them are malignant of those 50% which are malignant adenocystic carcinoma is constituted by these rest of the 50% malignant lesions are either adenocarcinoma or adenocarcinoma x pleomorphic adenoma or a mucoepidermoid variant of carcinoma or infiltrations of the lacrimal gland by secondary malignancy so basically 50% of malignant lesions are adenocystic carcinoma so simply remember 50% are epithelial 50% are non epithelial in epithelial 50% are benign 50 are malignant and 50% of malignant are adenocystic carcinoma pleomorphic adenoma occurs in the suprotemporal orbit very well circumscribed lesion producing displacement of the eye and very gradual proptosis well if it is causing indentation of the eye like this the patient may have distortion and astigmatism related uh, decrease in vision because of which they may come to you otherwise it lies quietly for a long time and then treatment of choice is complete excision it should never break the capsules of a pleomorphic adenoma because it may then recur and some of the recurrent lesions produce uh, carcinoma adenocarcinoma x pleomorphic adenoma so despite the presence of uh, erosion in the bone as you see here you still have a good chance of complete excision that erosion is only because of pressure related erosion you can completely excise this is an example of again a pleomorphic adenoma which has been growing a nodule so they can actually auto rupture their capsule and grow into uh, very bizarre shapes and sizes if they are chronic and if they are extremely vascular as you see here but it is still a pleomorphic adenoma whereas as compared to pleomorphic adenoma adenocarcinoma adenoid cystic carcinoma crosses the midline pleomorphic adenoma is generally lateral to the midline whereas if a lesion crosses the midline then you think of adenocarcinoma or adenoid cystic carcinoma once it crosses the midline the supraorbital nerve is right there so it is a neurotrophic tumor so patients sometimes have a symptom of an paresthesia in the forehead or pain referred pain paresthesia anesthesia of the forehead is a typical feature of adenoid cystic carcinoma they may come to you with those manifestations adenoid cystic carcinoma is uh, currently dealt with by multimodal treatment where you do a biopsy direct by of direct approach by obviously not through a lipid incision confirm the diagnosis confirm the cellular cellular type then tailor chemotherapy so that the tumor reduces in size so this is the size of the tumor that we began with there is a small medial extension as well around the medial rectus muscle definitely crossing the midline and after cycle three cycles of chemotherapy the tumor has obviously shrunken that is when you do a complete excision with a periosteum along with it that is called end block excision follow that up with stereotactic radiation and complete chemotherapy so this is a patient with adenoid cystic carcinoma where you can see that there is gross bone erosion so still despite which you can excise the tumor and complete the treatment and the bone often remodulates now if a patient has variable positional or pulsatile proptosis so this is a different class of manifestations patient has proptosis but it is variable that means when a patient is sitting down it changes its uh, measurement if the patient is bending down it is different it is pulsatile then you think of vascular lesion so like this patient has enough thalamus that's what she has and when you look at the inferior palpable area she has uh, bluish discoloration and abnormal blood vessels when you ask her to do valsalva maneuver there is uh, obviously a lesion that is showing up this is orbital varices now there is a very nice classification of vascular lesions i don't have time to go into the details of it but one more lesion that can also cause pulsatile proptosis is neurofibroma with a meningocele 
Now, this is a neurofibroma. Why does it cause meningocele? Because there is dysplasia of the spinoid vein. So, if the bone is missing in that area, there is direct communication of the brain to the orbit. And when the patient, uh, you know, has this kind of a situation, there is pulsation of the brain that is transmitted onto the eye. So, they have pulsatile proptosis. Next class of lesions are triradiate lesions. Triradiate lesions are the ones which center in the spinoid wing, have extension to the temporal fossa orbit and also intracranial. So five typical triradiate lesions that are quite common by the way are spinoid wing meningioma, eosinophilic granuloma, osteosarcoma, e-wings and metastasis. Like this lady has come to you with proptosis that is evident. But at the same time, look at her temporal fossa. Temporal fossa is generally flat or concave. This is convex. So if temporal fossa is convex and if the eyeball is uh, displaced inferiorly and medially, you expect a lesion here that is in the spinoid wing. And when you look at these patients on the scan, you find that there is temporal fossa extension, intracranial extension and intraorbital extension centered around the spinoid wing, which is the epicenter this is very, very typical manifestations of manifestation of spinoid wing meningitis. So if you have a patient with fullness of the temporal fossa, then you should suspect in an elderly individual spinoid wing meningitis. In a younger individual, the situation is different. If it is mainly osteolytic lesion with some reactive uh, changes around the bone, you and the lesion is still centered in the spinoid wing with orbital temporal fossa and intracranial extension, you suspect eosinophilic granuloma. This was a patient who was a retinoblastoma survivor who also presented with a triradiate lesion. Then that's the second malignant neoplasm, which is osteosarcoma. Very rare triradiate lesions can be Ewing sarcoma. You can see this sundry appearance of the bone and a lesion centered in the spinoid wing. Metastasis can also present on the spinoid, especially metastasis to the bone, such as prostate, can present as triradiate lesion. This is involving the spinoid, orbital component, a small intracranial component, and not much of extra orbital component. One more lesion where similar presentation is there is plasma cytoma. Again, you see that spinoid wing is destroyed a larger orbital component, a smaller intracranial component, and a medium-sized extra orbital or temporal fossa component. You can see the temporal fossa component here infiltrating the temporalis muscle. That's a very typical plasma cytoma. And if you do a CT scan in this patient, you find the typical punched out appearance. So that is about the stepwise approach to the orbit. I'll see if uh, Lakshmi has returned. Lakshmi, have you come back? Yes, Santosh, I've come back. Yeah, can you go ahead? No, please, yeah, please, go, please, ahead. please go ahead. Please go ahead. Well, I just have treatment now. I mean, I've finished with the series of... No, in, in any of these uh, cases where you have, you were anticipating something else and, you know, it turned out to be, please uh, highlight us. For instance, I, I have a question for you. Yeah. In these triradiate lesions, uh, mm -hmm. the classical teaching is um, neuroblastoma, right? When you see the typical sun ray appearance, it's a neuroblastoma. Yes. But you have mentioned correct. in your... Neuroblastoma in children. Pardon? In children, correct. In children, in children, that is the most yes. common lesion, now, neuroblastoma and does, neuroblastoma. Correct. How uh, does I it, uh, sorry, other than neuroblastoma, what else did you say? Nephroblastoma, Wilms tumor, metastatic Wilms yeah. tumor. But for nephroblastoma, so you that. an ultrasound of the abdomen, no, to confirm the... Correct, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Correct. Absolutely. And the next thing is, so, why does Ewing sarcoma... Cause this kind of an appearance there. So is histopathologically there is, is some kind of a similarity. Because yeah, I have not sarcoma, come across case of uh, sunray appearance with evings. Yeah, it it has uh, it's a round cell tumor and it occurs in the spinoid wing, and uh, yeah, so it has a triradiate confusion. This is this is the metastatic Wilms tumor. Wilms tumor again, so you can see the temporal fossa fullness. And uh, this patient also had intracranial relaxation to a CT scan. It's bilateral. And when the similar, exactly similar situation occurs, if there is periocular hemorrhage, raccoon eye sign, then that mm -hmm. is neuroblastoma. So exactly same except for hemorrhage. And you can see a very typical triradiate lesion, temporal fossa, intracranial and orbital extension. 
Mercedes but it Benz. need not be so uh, bilaterally so typical. No, it can absolutely. be unique. sometimes a, it can even be more on one side than the other. Absolutely, like absolutely. it can be asymmetrical. It can be unilateral. But these are just classic examples where you know there is bilateral, so people should never miss if they see something like this. The child has to go to a pediatric uh, oncologist, oncologist on the same day. You cannot even miss that. Would so you that, want to do a biopsy to confirm these cases? Well, Would your oncologist you know, suggest? Because in those days, they used to uh, insist. Yeah. Would you do it? Yeah, if they ask for it, you do a biopsy. Otherwise, huh. if they simply want to take over, if they want to go ahead and treat, do biopsy from the primary lesion, then they can. Orbit is more convenient to do a biopsy. So if they want a clinical confirmation, we can definitely want to uh, do a biopsy. And it's easily accessible lesion. So it, since it's so superficial, you can easily do a biopsy. But of course, in neuroblastoma, I've had situations where bleeding is excessive when you biopsy. So to be very careful because it's highly, highly, highly vascular. Vascular tumor. So you might still want to do biopsy with a fine needle aspiration cytology than do an open biopsy in there. Santosh, can we just go to some of your uh, uh, means not so common tumors where you can just explain a little more because I, I have a, now yeah, I'll, I'll take some time. If the others, if there are questions I can highlight, I may take some time to bring in other slides. But so I think because um, I missed some of them, some important pertinent questions. Now, this is typically a round cell tumor, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pathologically. Yes, sure. Yes, that's right. So yeah. I, I just go over, I mean, I, I mean, how much time do we have? I think we have about uh, 15 minutes. So 15 I minutes? Covered, okay. Yeah, so, so we'll go ahead with some, you know, basically what I was trying to say is that when you have diagnosed... Okay, them, one, okay. One, I have one curious question in that previous case, uh, that neuroblastoma mm -hmm. case. If you have to do a biopsy, um, if would you do it in the infratemporal fossa or would you do a lateral orbital incision? anterior orbital or lateral would, orbital incision. I would, yeah, I would do a small lateral incision and go to the temporal lesion then get into the orbit because if it bleeds, temporal uh, area is safer than okay. having bleeding in the orbit. Point take. So when we uh, have this clinical radiological confirmation or suspicion of diagnosis, uh, do we always do surgery? The answer is no. You know, we don't always do surgery. There are situations when you say clear no to surgery. There are situations when you say clear yes to surgery. And sometimes it is the gray zone. These are all no to surgery. But unless the oncologist insists, then uh, you don't want to do biopsy. Like this patient I earlier showed of granulocytic sarcoma, where there is subconjunctival hemorrhage, rot spots, and peripheral blood smear being positive. You never want to do biopsy because we already know that it is leukemia. Whereas in a patient with a triridiate lesion with punched out the appearance of the bone, but patient does not have multiple myeloma. So the radiology or the, uh, the oncologist wants a confirmation of diagnosis. Then you can do biopsy. Even a fine needle aspiration cytology is good enough in these patients. And if fine needle aspiration cytology does not yield enough material, you can go for an open biopsy. Then what are the non-surgical approaches? There are certain situations where you want to avoid surgery. Like this patient who's an airline pilot, whose main concern is that he was failed in the medical exam. He hardly has any abnormality. And if you notice it very carefully, he may have mild proptosis of the right eye. But why is that so? Because he has a lesion in the orbital apex, which is jutting into the superior orbital fissure area. It is kind of pear-shaped lesion posterior in the orbit. And he's an airline pilot and he does not know any other work. So what if cavernous and hemangioma surgeons delight, Lakshmi will tell you, but if you meddle in the superior orbital fissure area, even if you're very, very gentle, there is always a reason to worry because you might cause some hemorrhage or some stretch over the optic nerve or some extraocular muscle or any of the nerves passing through that area. So patients may have diplopia and this patient's occupation being flying. So obviously you cannot afford to have diplopia as visual field was also affected. So we chose to do a non-surgical approach here where we gave pyrotactic radiation. And you can see the size of the lesion has considerably shrunk down. So at least for the next five, six years, we thought he was good to go. And in fact, he is pulling on for eight years now. There is absolutely no change in the size of the lesion. And his visual fields have remained normal. He's back to flying. So there are these are the situations where you don't want to do surgery, especially if the lesion is very posterior in the orbit, very close to the superior orbital fissure. This so is from the question. lecture. Was yeah. this a hemangioma or you think it was a meningioma? It was a cavernous hemangioma. 
because of the vas like severe it. vascularity which you saw. Because sometimes yeah. meningiomas also can be pretty vascular. Yeah, yeah, they can. But MRI, you know, uh, flow voids and all, they are very confident of diagnosing cavernous and angioma in MRI. Okay. So this was seven year follow up. It shrank so much. Or uh, after how many days did it shrink to that size? Six months, because it's almost six like months, seventy percent yeah. shrinkage, right? It is definitely more than that. So it started shrinking at about three months of age, um, it, you know, following oh, radiation. Wow. Hmm. And by six months, he had partial uh, resolution of visual fields. And uh, obviously, it has remained stable for the last five years. So by two years, most of the shrinkage was complete. After that, you know, he was absolutely stable. He has never increased in size and it has very little vascularity. This is from the literature, actually. You can see how dramatic visual field has improved in this patient. Uh, this is published case in the literature, Ismaili's group. And uh, you can see that the small lesion has shrunk further smaller. And the optic nerve, pressure over the optic nerve has uh, gone away. So they did a volumetric analysis and they found that there was 76% volume reduction in this patient. So um, this is possible. So you don't have to do surgery in all patients. So in fact, Moritz went on to say that beware of pear-shaped lesions. If there's a posterior orbital clearing like this, then that is very safe to operate. You know, something that looks like an apple. But if it is pear-shaped like this with the snout getting into the superior orbital fissure, then try alternative methods. And if you're not sure radiologically as to what the diagnosis is, then only venture on to do biopsy, etc. But if your radiologist is quite comfortable with the diagnosis, then you can try alternative measures. So now, what do you think stereotact, I'll, I'll please, in, I'll interrupt. Uh, sure. Stereotactic, was it, you said the, here it's gamma knife. Now, some yeah. of them are saying cyber is better than gamma. What has been your personal experience on the cyber and gamma? Because what I'm told is it's mainly an interplay in the LINAC. That's what I mentioned in my talk. But what Absolutely. do you think is yeah. better? Especially, let's start with I, meningioma, I, where we really these days not doing a biopsy, straight away subjecting the patient. What is your choice? Is it gamma knife or cyber knife? Cyber knife, you know, because you, we can't afford to have both. So we have what we have, what we have to use. Cyber right. knife is what is there at Apollo. So we use oh, that and right. happy with the results. And even in the literature, it is comparable. So you really don't have to worry about what, whether they use cyber knife or gamma knife, because finally they're going to give you results. And results are quite satisfactory. So comparable. So you, as an oft, ocular oncologist, you don't have to worry about what modality are they going to use as, as long as they use one of these. Are the treatment rates comparable between both? Both are equally expensive? Both, both. Yeah, treatment rates are, you know, it depends on the facility. But uh, okay. CyberNF is slightly more expensive okay. in some facilities. Because I also recently got a patient treated in Apollo Chennai. It was done very well, just about yes. five sittings. And uh, the, the, we have to see the long term because right now we're not appreciating too much of shrinkage. It was a meningioma. Right. But definitely the disc edema has come down and the vision is preserved. Yeah. So, but the other patient with the eye takes a cyber long time. Hmm? Hmm. Meningioma takes a long time to uh, redu reduce in size. The first thing to go away is vascularity. And they might be at the most 30-40% reduction in the size of the limb. Tumor. But what happens ultimately is that they remain stable for a long time and that's exactly what you want. Even if the patient loses slight vision over 5, 15, 5, 10, 15 years, they're acceptable with it rather than losing vision immediately because of surgery. So radiation is definitely better than surgical debulking. And so. so the important pearl from you is you have stopped doing biopsy for a meningioma? Biopsy we do to know the uh, WHO grading. Ah. And then, uh, because, you know, our but if it's the posteriorly located, like this is pear shaped lesion, beware located, of the pear. Located, you cannot do biopsy unless by CT guided FNAC. Hmm. Otherwise, if it's accessible, even accessible uh, from the lateral approach or deep lateral orbitotomy, uh, insistence is on biopsy because we need to know what is the grade of the lesion so that they can tailor the um, dose of radiation accordingly. If it is a very low grade tumor, they don't extend radiation beyond 4,500 centigrade. But if it's a high-grade lesion, because we don't know the timeline, patient would have come to you at a particular time, would have done scan. If you serially follow them up, then you know what is the aggressiveness of the lesion, how has it been growing. So if it's a rapidly growing lesion, obviously there is high cellularity and then the dose of radiation is also slightly higher. They go on up to 6,000 centigrade if it's uh, depending on the cell type. 
so they would want to know if you cannot do that because of logistic reasons if the region is very posterior then they accept it as a fait accompli and then treat to you know the to the best of their ability if you can But do you a biopsy you explain the risk of vision loss due to yes. the biopsy itself or you just yeah. go see the lesion and take out a small portion and come out we always take a small portion we don't extensively you know disturb it very small portion is all that is required and you have not noted any vision loss because of that small incisional biopsy not because of biopsy no 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 not okay, because that's... of biopsy nobody has lost vision so okay. when patients can lose vision in orbital surgery it's like one in 100 cases reported in the literature one in 1000 patients generally so but uh, not because of because earlier on uh, i was uh, one or two cases of my meningioma they lost vision because there we were attempting debulking in addition that time we didn't have yeah. this is in the late 90s we didn't have any cyber gamma knife at that time but later on yeah. uh, you know our last four cases i managed without uh, biopsy itself anyway it will be interesting to see we'll have to talk about that at another time very nice thanks yeah. uh, please finish off anything more you have to say please how many That's more minutes we have time. we have 5 7 minutes and the session and the next 10 minutes yeah 10 minutes any other slide of your santosh where you have not ah injections no. but that's good bleomycin yeah. you have okay. yeah bleomycin and pisibanil so either mm -hmm. of which is good pisibanil is difficult to obtain uh, it's a japanese drug which has to be imported so basically you use that in patients who have no functional problem yet the lesion is extensive it is all around the optic nerve it's around the lateral rectus in medial rectus superior rectus lps complex lacrimal gland where surgical debulking is fraught with complication so there if the patient wants cosmesis and patient wants relief from multiple recurrent bleedings that she experiences then injection would be a good option now we know that bleomycin can be toxic to the optic nerve so you don't inject a large volume especially if it is a macro cystic lesion you can inject larger volume whatever you aspirate half the amount can be injected but if it's a micro cystic lesion then i restrict my injection to 1 cc of pleomycin at one point in time you can always go back and inject more and if it is a micro cystic lesion then resolution is very good if it's micro cystic resolution is low this patient had a micro cystic lesion yet you can see how beautifully she has resolved so this is one of the better results but not all patients resolve as nicely as this you may need to interrupt injection. its excision plus bleo or only bleo only bleo mice only bleo mice. bleo okay and what is the and youngest age you have given bleo mice in bleo mice in i have given in a 6 month old child where there was oh. uh, yeah where there was a chocolate cyst after aspiration of the chocolate cyst injection was given so the same dose but you uh, or you give even lesser for a child not required you aspirate see suppose the aspirate is 3 cc i give half of it okay volume give half the volume of what you have aspirated aspirate correct correct and uh, generally a chocolate cyst will burst and it will let out all that ch that chocolate colored blood do you try to take out a little bit of the wall as well no when you do a aspiration it is only a blind aspiration or ultrasound guided or ct guided aspiration you don't open it at all okay so you aspirate and then with the same needle with the needle held in position change the syringe to bleomycin and inject within the same cavity you don't come out at all so you the drug directly gets into the wall of the chocolate cyst so you don't open at all in such situation i have so a curious is, question like now. this is how this is the you, okay how often do you do fnac now because earlier on we were doing so many of those fnac only for lymph nodes we do it this is what i was showing you see this there is no incision at all correct this is the no incision at all absolutely no incision okay and we aspirated so much of blood earlier this is a older slide we used to give equal volume now we give just half of it equal volume because that is what the standard teaching is because even uh, if you give half of it within a couple of injection it resolves so i think restricting the volume is also important so that you can avoid complication this was a child where somebody else had biopsy and it had rebled and uh, this was the residual and you can see one injection almost everything is gone except that in the posterior orbit and the child has 
reasonable amount of prospectus. So it works very well. Bleomycin and Pisibanil both work very well. And uh, depending on what drug that is available to you, this was a patient where we did not know what the diagnosis was. Radiologists were not very, very keen to say, confirm it was lymphangioma. It was an acute proptosis in a child who never had such a history earlier. So we had to do an open biopsy here. And this is where I could take out part of the wall that uh, as you are describing. And uh, obviously, when you do that and uh, inject gliomycin, you have to be careful because the drug can extravasate into the orbit. So yet, that is the only option that we have because it's a larger diffuse lesion. And that was given. And this was a patient where you're asking whether debulking is done. Yes, this patient was debulked. And for the residual bleomycin was given. So you can use a permutation and combination. This patient, nothing was done except aspiration and bleomycin. So you can use a permutation and combination. You simply don't have to restrict uh, yourself to one modality. Depending on uh, whatever is the situation, you can either give uh, injection, do debulking and give injection, or... Just do debug. Yeah, I have a question to Santosh. Santosh oh, you're there, Kasturi. How come? It's fantastic talk. I have listened to both Lakshmi ma'am saying your talk. Like, it's so <laughs> engrossing. I couldn't leave. Hey, if, you, if you knew you were here, we would have made you talk as well. No, Santosh, it's too good. Learn so many. It's so good learning points. Bleomycin, do in a child, do you do you give half the volume? Do you keep the dose of 0.5 per kg body weight? Like, how no, do you... I'm... It is always less than that. It's always less than that. So I just restrict myself to half the aspirate. Okay. It is always, I mean, even if you do 0.5 international units per kg body weight, it is always less than what you ever give. So, you know, you generally give about 2-3 cc. So it's always underdosed. Never a systemic problem. Santosh, I started using PC panel sometime in 97 or 98. After about 2001 or two, gave up on it because it was not working. And I'm so happy to note you're saying that it is working well. Like we had only it a 50-50 result. And I, I tried, then I went back to Tricot all these years. And the last six, seven years, I've been using bleomycin. Pretty happy with the outcome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Bleomycin uh, is very good. You, you definitely feel it is still 50-50 because what you say will be very important because I may be tempted to go back and use Pisibanala. Otherwise, I had written it off for good. Remember, Dr. No, Ogita, he came for our meeting in 99. He was the one who used it extensively for cystic hygromas and lymphangiomas elsewhere. In fact, he passed away a few years back, the Japanese doctor, and he has an Ogita foundation for lymphangiomas but when he saw some of our orbital lymphangiomas he almost gave up he said oh no i don't think i'll use pisibanil for this that's what dr ogita told us when he came for our meeting in 99 but um honestly like are you really happy with pisibanil and where are you getting it from that i'll ask no, you i'm because happy because not in the it, forum. no no they give it free of charge all uh -huh. you have to bear is the courier charges it comes from japan the only catch here is that you have to get approval from the Drug Control Authority of India and it is patient-wise approval. So we have to collect the Aadhaar card and identity data of the documents of the patient and when the drug arrives in the customs, the patient representative has to go. That is one of our hospital staff has to go and collect okay. it. So that way it is logistically difficult, but it is absolutely free by the PCBanel Foundation. Only commitment that we have is to provide them with the data, which is okay to provide. So in, you know, before COVID, it was easy. Now that particular, you know, it stopped. And by the mm -hmm. way, from what they were doing earlier, they have uh, re-evolved the medicine. It's a different formulation now, I believe, okay. which works. Yeah, it works as good as bleomycin. But the only advantage of Pisibanil, I feel, is that there is zero inflammation. So you should not mm -hmm. be worried That's about... True. That I 100% agree with you. So intraconal lesions, if you have in a patient with 20-20 N6 vision, then definitely my heart would be kind of beating faster if I give bleomycin. But this is Daniel, I would not be worried. Uh, something interesting I'd like to share, ma'am. I was also there in the 1999 meeting. But yes, you were there. You were very much there. Uh, Dr. Saikian, you know what happened? Like in my initial days when the patient used to come with blue, I mean this lymphangioma, for some reason for MGD or something, I used to keep Cyclin, long time back, and I could see there was some regression of the lesion. The oral loxycycline I was giving uh, uh, for how many days? Generally, was, we give it for 21 days for uh, MGD. A month, I used to give. Uh -huh. That I was, I used to notice, but I never took it very sincerely. But I feel that even oral loxycycline really has a role. Like 
Now the people are also giving injectables, right? Injectable so, doxycycline is done anyway. That is accepted. But I think I don't know. I, I have those patients, at least four or five patients I remember just for MGD I have given who were also having lived in Choma and it had really shrunk the lesion to quite a I mean, good extent. And with bleomycin, do you both give IV steroids soon after the injection to bring down the violent reaction due to bleomycin? Because oral steroids alone may not help. the re And sometimes the reaction is noted on the following day. What do you do? So I see them on the following day. I do it as an OPD procedure. I don't generally give, unless I am injected intraconally, I don't give steroids. But when I see them on the following day, if they have developed inflammation severe, then we give one injection of intravenous steroids. It is a good idea not to give because, you know, you want to induce sclerosis. And if you give steroids, the effect of sclerosing agent will be much less. So you don't want to give long-term steroids. One injection is okay. Yes, ma'am, same. I never give steroid, but two patients had compartment syndrome. So those two oh. patients, two of my patients, those two patients, I gave IVMP only to prevent him.